make something more complicated than you need to do. So when we go and we talk about smooth models and, and L2 models, just keep that in mind. So we're critical of having smooth models, but we don't have any petrophysics to constrain them. So you end up with, with a smooth model. So we have to, we have to keep that in mind. Um, just skipping to the end, the only way we get the only way we get pseudogeology is to is to have physical properties. Right? You would not get pseudogeology without physical properties. So at the end, if, if anyone can guess before I get to the last slide, why I put the cast of Ratatouille up on the slide? But um, that's the outline. It's really weird to look at your own slide deck from here. Like, um, so I guess I'm doing the introduction now. I'm going to go through the, the um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Gartner hype cycle for, for, for new technology. And this talk is kind of based on that. So I'm going to go around that. We're going to do a little bit on uh, inversion basics and some pitfalls. And I'm sure everyone has their, uh, has their pet inversion that was completely wrong. But I've got, a, I've got my favorite one. Uh, then we're going to talk how we get towards pseudogeology, a little case study from Klee Kui Cho. And then what I call the plateau of uh, productivity. So, but before we get there, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this project management tire swing. Uh, and all those boxes, it's it's the the one on the bottom right. You know what the what the customer really needed, which is that. And what the customer, what I think my customer is, right? The the geologist and the the well, if, the, if they're the customer, it's probably the drill manager with the budget. What they want from me is to know is to identify rocks, right? They want me to tell them where to drill as accurately as I can. Everything else is kind of this, I know, I know it's uh, that box at the top where I just have a blob of some susceptibility anomaly. But, you know, you go through all these things, uh, I'm trying to, I, mean, I can't read them from here, but, you know, my favorites are, you know, the bottom left, I think that says uh, how it was supported. Uh, the bottom center, you know, how the customer was built, you know, the roller coaster. Um, you know, how the business consultant described it, the, you know, the, the lounge chair hanging from the, from the tree, so. This is just important to me, remembering what the customer wants, and I think the customer wants, again, is, is, is a geological model. So this is the inversion of the hype cycle. There's generally a, a technology trigger followed quickly by a peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, there's a slope of enlightenment, and the plateau of productivity. And this isn't just technology, uh, well, and inversions, but this is the, I'm sure, the, the typical stock for a junior. Richard could probably tell us that, right? Uh, with the peak of, you know, the trough almost being, once they decide that they're gonna make it a mine, <laughs> and now they have to start to raise money, and for the next couple of years, it just it just sinks and sinks and sinks while while money's being spent and nothing's being made. So we're going to go through all of these, but I think the technology trigger is in about 1991, um, and it was a, it was at that time that UBC. I'm fine. I, I mean, I you know I've worked most of my life in in Vancouver. We have a close uh, affiliation. Uh, all the companies I've worked for, Kennecott. Kaminko and Tech, and now Anglo-American, and we've all a close affiliation with UBC, so there's going to be some UBC bias in my talk here. But this, this Jackie consortium um, started in 1991, and interestingly it was called the Joint and Cooperative Inversion, which was a great name for it, but they never came close to getting anywhere near that. It's probably took them 20 years before they, before they finally got there. And I think after this first um, the first round of funding, the jockey was dropped and they went to GIF, which was just the geophysical inversion facility, because, you know, I've never actually spoken to Doug about that, but I mean, that had to be the change, because they, again, they weren't anywhere near doing joint and cooperative conversions. And those were the consortium sponsors at the start. Um, and there's been lots of, uh, lots of consolidation in those and uh, the companies buying other companies and well, that's what it was. These were the companies who at the start had uh, probably chief geophysicists who, who saw value in being able to take, I'd say at the start it was, it was, it was probably IP and gravity data and trying to get a, a better understanding of the subsurface from that. So that was the technology trigger. The peak inflated expectations, I just think that this is about the right time, but this is a uh, resistivity and chargeability inversion of, um, of Century, which is a sink line in Queensland. Um, 
And there's the outline of the, of the ore um, in, the, in the black dots. And we have a nice chargeability line or blobs that are kind of lining up. And I think this was kind of held out, at least within, uh, well, this was a CRA discovery, but at the time it was called RTZ CRA. It was a hyphenated company. Um, you know, this is what people were expecting. Um, and is this a geophysical discovery? No, it's that um, the Euro Urbanus has probably told Sean and everyone who, who would listen, Mike, if they had only let me run my IP crew across the river one more day, you know, he would have found it. But, but they didn't, and their program stopped, and the geologists went in. And then the next year, they went and they did this, and it's like they found it, and, they, and then the geologist says, Well, I already found it. What, what do we need you for? But that's just the way it goes. So I think at, at, this was one of the early successes of, uh, of inversion. And it was expected that from this point on, it was going to be like shooting fish in a barrel. So I'm just going to step back. And many of you are, some of you are geophysicists. And um, those of you who uh, went to UBC probably understand this better than I do. But this is just a very simple problem of what inversion is like. So we have four unknowns, M1, M2, M3, M4. And we have two data. The data are six and two, right? So we have an underdetermined system. We have, we have to use six and two to try and guess what M1, M2, M3, M4. And how do we do that? Well, if you don't have any other information, like you can do whatever you want. So we need to come up with a way to think about how we're going to do this. So there are the four models down the down the left. All those numbers, those four sets of numbers, they all add up. They all solve that equation. So then, what we have to do in the absence of data, we do something mathematical, and we, it's called a norm. So, and in the first column there, that's just, we just add up all the numbers in the solution. And often what we want, this is like with Occam's razor, you want the simplest solution. So you add them all up, and the simplest would be, when you add them up, be the smallest number. So those are the ones that are highlighted in yellow. So, in the, in the first column, which is our L1 norm, uh, which is just adding up all the data, it adds up to 2.081, that's the smallest. So if, if you choose to use an L1 norm, you would pick uh, the fourth row. We generally use this L2 norm, which is kind of a, you know, a, a least squares-ish kind of approach. And when you do that, you would pick the second case, because there, 7.287 is the smallest. And in the last column, um, this is where we're actually looking at the gradient, where we're looking at the, the difference between two numbers in the model. And then in that case, um, you, you would pick the first one. So right away, with the simple one, we know nothing, but there's already three solutions, depending on what we want. And now you think, well, now we're going to have 100 or maybe a, a, you know, 500 mag data that we're going to throw into an inversion, but our model is going to have 50,000 cells in it. So this is, the, this is the scale of the problem that we're trying to solve. And so the first thing to remember is that, especially in the unconstrained inversion, when we say that something has, you know, has converged, or this is the model, it's a model in the sense of one of these norms. So that being said, I think the models, they might be blobby and stuff, but they actually do a fairly decent job, at least in many cases, describing the gross situation of what's happening. But it is important, I think, to tweak these models and look at different parameters to see what, how your model turns out. If you, if you were to use two different normalizations or slightly different normalizations, where, these, where those models agree, you could have added confidence that it's telling you what's there. And so you may want to look at where they, where they disagree, and, and, and that may be very interesting. So then there's also on the, um, on the data side, and of course I can't, I guess if I stand on my tiptoes, I can over here because I can't really see that either. But uh, because data are, are inaccurate, any model that reproduces them exactly is guaranteed to be wrong. Well, we know from George Box that any model we make is going to be wrong. And again, what we hope is that some of them are useful. So the realistic goal is to find models whose predicted data are consistent with some observational errors. And we can use these chi squared statistics, and we're not going to really get into that. But the expectation is that this phi d is is the number of, is um, is that it's going to conv it's going to converge to some number where phi d is n and the n is the number of data and you're going to have a standard deviation of two n. So the key thing in here is that there's a 66 I got to step my too close again. There's a 66 percent chance that the misfit between the true model 
And the observations lie in the range of n plus or minus square root 2 times n. And so again, any models are wrong. So when you get a model, just, just start to think. And, and a challenge that we've had in the old days is, um, well, even now still, models took so long to compute, when it finally computed and it didn't crash, it's like, great, here it is, and you go and hand it over, and this model would, would now live, right? And even as a geophysicist, we could go and explain that it's probably you know, not perfect and we should look at this and this. That was kind of ignored. Here's this model. It's dumped into every single section and spreadsheet from, from then on. And, it, and it, it didn't live. It just sort of got sort of hewn in stone. So this is something that we're, I think we're, we have, we're starting to, and we have to get away from that. Because we know that there's no one model that fits everything, we have to stop handing over one model and claiming that it fits everything, or assuming that it fits everything. So the trough of disillusionment. So we started, we had the Jackie Consortium, we did some versions we found century, or predicted where it was exactly, that's great. And now people start to abuse the process. Um, so what we have here, this is some, some chargeability <laughs> data. And uh, so there's the, the observations on top. Uh, so the top pseudo section is the observations. The bottom uh, section is actually the inverted profile. And the middle pseudo section is the forward model. So we compare the top to the middle uh, based on the model on the bottom. We go, that's a good fit. We like this. So this is, uh, so we collected this data and we had that model. But you look at that model and you go, does that really look geological? Now, maybe ignore the bit here at the bottom. Oops. How do I? How do you use this? So ignore everything below here because that's just we, the model can't resolve anything deep deep in that. But does this look geological to you? And when we saw this, um, you know, the geologist, this was given to the geologist, and they were starting to think, well, maybe there's this and this and this, and you know, I think a geophysicist who has experience in this looks at this and go, well, I'm not so sure. So what actually happens is if you do the QC of this data you find that there are these two really wonky points on the edge. Um, so this is what happens when you remove these two wonky points from the inversion. <laughs> like they laugh, but this is serious shit. Like, take, take those two points out and you go from this to that. And one of the problems with this is, I mean, generally, if you have some data points that are in the middle of your pseudo section, you basically have enough good data points around it, and the model can sort of see, you know, this is kind of crap and go through. But if you have crap data on the edge of your, on the edge of your surveys, the model, you know, it, there's no support around, it and it, and it, so it ends up just propagating into the in, into the model. So this is one of the cases why. Um, when Ian McLeod first came out with Voxy, I remember him, him telling me, you know, I want to have, I want to have Voxy on the desk of every geologist. And I'm saying, like, you might as well give a child an Uzi, right? <laughs> <laughs> so now we come onto the slope of enlightenment, and we can all have our, you know, we all have our point things. For me, it was Nick Williams' PhD thesis, uh, 2009, and Nick is, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but he's basically a geologist who went and did his PhD in the geophysics, in the, in the geophysics group at, at UBC, and I think he brought in you know, a lot of geological feeling, or, uh, thinking. So this is a, a density model, this is a Ford model he made up of density, and you do, so he forward modeled that, and then he did an inversion on the forward model. Um, and this is what he got, so this is just the unconstrained inversion. Then, so his PhD was towards looking at constraints. How can we look at the data? Here, he goes and he puts in surface constraints. So just adding, you know, what the, what the geology map looked like on surface. He didn't have any depth information. He just said, I'm going to constrain the first row of cells. It looks like that. And then he threw in a bit about what he knew about basement and some geometry. And you added a borehole. And you added two boreholes. And I'm going to say, uh, well, what's the biggest bang for the buck? Anyone? Anyone? You? Euler? The surface constraints. You need a geological map. 
the amount of information that you get from, from the geological map and the way it can, constrains your model, if you think about it, well, to me, borehole constraints are basically a, a red herring. You have a model that might have 500,000 cells in it. Your borehole touches 20 of them. That's really going to you know, help you fix your model. But your surface geology map may touch 10,000 of those cells. And it's closest to the sensor. So using the 80-20 rule, uh, to say that you're, you know, this is, oh, well, you don't have one yet. Um, that's the biggest bang for the buck. So we need to get more, more surface constraints. And I remember being with a, a, a geologist in Australia, gave me some data, and he said, can you do an inversion? And I said, well, you know, uh, what can you tell me about the property? He said, well, it's new, we don't have anything wrong. And I said, well, do you have a map? He said, yeah, it's the government map, but it's not wrong. Like this, you know, this, this granite is really granite diorite. And I'm going, well, okay, fair enough. I'm going, what's all this yellow stuff? He said, that, that's cover. Oh, is that mapped in the right place? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, the cover's good, right? So right away, we know, I mean, I mean, if it's density, you know that your rock is going to be 2.6, whatever, and your cover's going to be 2.2. Like, we're not splitting hairs as this 2.67 or 2.66. There's a huge contrast there. And to be able to tell the model that, it's great. So then I said, well, do we know anything about the depth? He said, no, it's never been drilled before. I said, are there, any, are there any water wells around there? He said, yeah, but you don't want those. They don't hit bedrock. It's like, yeah, but they tell me how deep bedrock is at a minimum, right? So you can get this data to start to populate it, and you get your models improved quickly. So continue on the slope and lightning. I think we had, we had Nick's work. And then basically, going back to the earlier slide, we now have different kind of model norms. And we did at the time, but I don't really think that we appreciated using them enough. So these are just a bunch, and there are were, there were way more uh, that can be used. So it's just, so we've, we've I think we're, we're appreciating that we can do more with model norms. Um, and now we're going to petrophysics, and this is sort of going to get into the crux when we want to have uh, pseudo-geology. So, yeah, I mean, geologists are interested in texture, mythology, stratigraphy, geophysicists. Fortunately, I mean, it's, it's nice having people on your team with different perspectives because they bring different things to the table. So that geophysicists might be interested in density and excess and conductivity or resistivity. And now we can start to say, well, each rock type is going to have you know, different contrast. So, and this is just a very simple, um, you know, we've got sulfides and granite. So the sulfides are high density, high susceptibility, uh, high conductivity, and high chargeability, and the granite is moderate or low. So if we start to plot things just based on physical properties, we sh from this you could, if, if there's only two end members in this, in, this, in this model, you should be able to tell, based on those physical properties, what rock is, is what, without even looking at it. So this is the kind of work that's, uh, you know, that's happening it's up now, it, 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 but a single property is generally insufficient, so you need at least two. And then, I, I guess, one of the key things is to find out uh, which two do you want. Five more minutes. Okay, good. So, this is what we need to start to do. We need to have physical properties. You're right, in the, in the regional context, uh, when you're flying, you know, half of northern Ontario, it's, it's difficult to go out and put physical properties. But on our advanced drill projects, if you want to really enhance that geological model, you need to know that. And you need to know the physical properties. Like, you can't just have one value, like a, a minimum. You really, if you want to do this well, you need to have sufficient data that you can derive some, some statistics and look at Gaussian or log normal distributions, uh, because that's going to reflect nature in your model. So this, uh, I think we're now getting near the plateau of productivity. This is the work, uh, this guy, Jeremy Giroux, from, Giroux from uh, he's a recent PhD from the University of, of Western Australia. He took the probabilistic nature of the, of the physical properties and threw it into a Monte Carlo uncertainty estimation. And here's his little flow chart, I'm not gonna go through it, but he's got um, you know, the, the geological side is in green and the petrophysics is in yellow and the geophysics is in red. So he kind of iterates all these down and then he takes these three, he takes a geophysical data set, 
a geological starting model and his petrophysics, and he throws it into this, this he throws it into one equation, which is called the objective function, and he minimizes all three of them um, at once, and then he does it uh, in this kind of stochastic sense. And this is his, one of his outputs, where now he's taken that, his forward model that now he's done an inversion, and this is his probability of these, of these lithologies. So you can actually see that he's, he's able to do a pretty good job to reconstruct the original, the original model. What this takes is, again, it takes decent physical properties. So this isn't something that you're going to do on a regional sense, but once you start to have drill holes, you can start to build up this kind of model. Now at UBC, I really like uh, this guy's work. This is uh, Thibaut Astic, he's a PhD candidate up at UBC 2020. I didn't ask him when I put that down, so I don't know when to look. He's going to finish this year. Sean says he's going to finish, that means he's going to finish. Um, so what, he, what he's actually done is instead of taking the geology, the petrophysics, and the geophysics and throwing it in to this one objective function and inverting it, he kind of does this little iterative approach. So he treats each of them differently and he has, he has reasons why you shouldn't invert for the geology and the, or try to minimize the geology and the geophysics at once. But um, he has this paper which uh, is way above my head but it, I've, I've read it now I think three times and I'm starting to understand. So this is Kli uh, Cho, which is the, the old DO27 Kimberlite. And on the left is, he's basically done an, done an unconstrained inversion, plot up all the black dots are, the, are, are, the, are the, the physical property values, and this is a smooth inversion so you get this big, you get this big blob going from here over to there. And this is one of the things that we require, but this is not nature. Right? This is our smooth inversion. It fits the objective function. It, 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 it gives a model that reproduces the data, but this is not what it looks like. Um, so he uses this, uh, this, he calls it PGI inversion. He clustered the results and you get a three multimodal distribution. And now he sees that he has this HK, which looks like it's, that's the hydrobisal kimberlite, the pyroclastic or cataclastic kimberlite in the background. So, in his methodology, he was able to come up with an inversion that basically separated uh, those, um, basically those three rock types. Um, this is neat. I did this in 2004. I was quite proud of this. This is smooth inversions. I did a density version. I did a mag sauce inversion. I did a conductivity version. This is DO18. Uh, this is DO27. And the uh, models so that was cool back then but I mean again it's quite blobby and the Kimberlites really don't I mean everything's centered in the right place but did it really look like that uh, depends how close you want to get to um, so they've gone and and re looked at this this is a here he is a geo model from post inversion clustering with six clusters on individual guided or on individual petrophysically guided results anyway he did separate inversions and lumped them all together and clustered it and ended up with a model like that. And this is a section through uh, DO27. But when he actually throws the geology and guides the inversion, so he's able to make a model that's much more compact. So if you see, um, those are the oh, something works. Here. No. Those are the the units, and then in the new one, he's really able. To, he's been really able to cluster the uh, the results, and these are the the physical properties down there. So we want to stay productive uh, since we're on the plateau of productivity. I think we have to stop the, the vicious cycle, which is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different response. Um, I think we have to maybe start to consider a value of the information proposition. So do we need, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you say that you need more borehole geophysical data, I think we should be able to elucidate what's the value of collecting that data, right? How is that going to improve our model? How is that going to improve the next drill hole siting? Um, I think we need to rephrase the question. I think we have to think of geophysics as a condemnation tool, especially on regional surveys. We should be able to say, we can argue about what's an anomaly and what might be there, but it's kind of like wine or art, I think. We can, you know, we can disagree on what's better, a cab or Merlot, but we should all be able to agree on what's crap. Right. And it's the same with it's, it's the same with geology. So, if I can fly a big regional block and right away, if we can condemn eighty percent of it, 
one, we're not going to waste our time working on that, and we can drop those claims and save money and put our resources to someone else. So a lot of what we're doing these days is, is trying to focus the problem. And that includes getting rid of what you don't want. So what's required? Uh, multiple high quality survey data collected at the right resolution. We've talked about that, but the previous speakers did. Geological constraints at a minimum surface geology. I think we need statistically significant petrophysical data, certainly if you want to get the kind of results that Drew and Astic are getting. And you need trained practitioners. Which is basically why I brought up you know, Ratatouille. And Ratatouille, you know, Chef Gusteau said, anyone could cook. But the thing is, anyone can cook, but not everyone should cook, right? So anyone can convert doesn't mean that everyone should convert. And that's it, except for the acknowledgement. So UBC GIF, uh, Doug Oldenburg, I pilfered a few slides from him. I've had lots of good discussions with, with Chad at Tech. Uh, Nick, from Barrick, Jeremy, and Dominique, and the cast of Red Studio. <laughs>